مرحبا اليوم راح نحكي عن القاموس وخاصة قاموس هانز فير. Today we'll be talking about the dictionary El Camus, and particularly the Hans Ver dictionary. Now, the best dictionaries for Arabic, the ones that are really the most useful, are arranged by root. That is, they're not just arranged by finding one word exactly how it's written on the page and looking it up alphabetically, but instead you find the root of that word and you can find all the words from that same root on the same couple of pages. Now this of course means that we need to learn to find the root. And this is a useful skill in general because once you start to know more and more roots, if you see an unfamiliar word that's from that same root, you'll start to be able to guess what the meaning is. So remember that in Arabic, all words are the combination of the root, which is three, sometimes four, occasionally as many as five consonants. And remember that wow and yeah are ambiguous. They can be either consonants or vowels and patterns, which are mostly vowels, but some patterns also add consonants. If we remove the pattern, then the root will emerge from the word. Of course, we don't know all of the patterns, but what we can do is we can try to eliminate the usual suspects. For example, tamarbuta, it's just not, doesn't even really count as a root marker, as a letter in Arabic. It's just an extra thing that marks the feminine. So it's never going to be part of the root. There is no tamarbuta section of the dictionary. Aleph. Now, Aleph is not ambiguous like wow and ya are in general. It's usually just a vowel, but very occasionally it represents a hamza, which is usually written on top of it, but some people are lazy and don't write that. But in general, your first suspect for something extra, some sort of patterny thing, should be the Aleph. Meme. Meme is usually part of the pattern and not the root, especially at the very beginning of the word. Almost 100% if there's a meme at the beginning of the word, it's probably not part of the root. There's lots of words that refer to people and places, and these usually have memes in front of them. So mekteb and muhendis. Notice that muhendis is a four consonant root. Ha, nun, del, sin. Ta. Ta is part of a lot of verb patterns, especially as the first or second letter in a verb. So we have the patterns tafa, Tafa'ala, tafa'ala, iftala. So notice what we want to get rid of that ta. Notice that one of those patterns also has an aleph that we'd want to get rid of. Noon. Of course, there's another verb pattern that starts with a noon, or an aleph noon. And so, especially if we see a verb at the beginning of the verb, if there's a noon, we should be pretty suspicious. Seen occasionally comes in with a ta as well. And again, we should be suspicious of that when we see it in a verb. But as we learn these patterns, this will become more clear and obvious. Now, if we find an unfamiliar word, we need to find three possible root letters to check out. There are multiple steps in how we can start clearing things out of the word and then start looking it up. So step one, get rid of anything that is obviously not part of going to be part of the root. Aleph lam. It's something you add on to a word. It's not part of a, an essential part of a word. The verb conjugations. When we say yeru, that first ye yeah is very obviously part of the conjugation, not going to be part of the root. This is fairly obvious, but sometimes it's easy to forget it. Get rid of pronoun suffixes. Occasionally, it'll be a little bit confusing. Well, I have this pronoun suffix, and it's a k. Is that part of the root, or is that part of uh, a suffix? Sometimes you just have to keep that sort of in your mind as being ambiguous. It might be one, it might be the other. Once you've done this, look. Have you found three and only three consonants? If so, you can probably go to the dictionary. Step two. All right, we still have extra stuff. There's some wows and yes. We're not really sure if those are going to be part of it or not. Ignore them for the moment. Have you found three and only three consonants? All right. If you have, you can go to the dictionary. Finally, ignore those unlikely consonants, right? So if you have five, six consonants in a word, start looking, are there, are there memes, are there T's especially? Then maybe see if there's some S's. If so, if you found three consonants, go to the dictionary. If not, start looking at the possible combinations. You might have two or three possibilities. And then, 
you go to the dictionary and you have to check each possibility. This is a bit of a pain. However, it's really important to do this because it builds your ability to find the root and it also will help you learn to use the dictionary more efficiently. So this is our little green friend, Hans Ver. It's an Arabic-English only dictionary. There is no English to Arabic section of it. We use Hans Ver because, among other things, you can find copies of it online fairly easily that are hosted web pages, um, and because it's still just one of the best tools. All right, it just has a lot of history. It has most of the words you'll ever need to look up. And while there are some new dictionaries that have come recently, I'll talk about those at the end. This is what we're going to be using in class because it's what is best, easiest for you to get familiar with at first. And many dictionaries are organized in a very similar way. So, how are the entries organized in general? They're alphabetical by the root letters. Sometimes you might have a root that has the second two letters are exactly the same. In that case, it'll come at the very beginning of all the entries, before any other letters. In the, when it shows you a word, it doesn't necessarily just say the root letters and then have the entries under that. It just shows you the verb. It starts with the verbs. And it always starts with Form 1. Now, if you remember, Form 1 has a lot of parts that you can't know without just memorizing them, right? And therefore, the dictionary tells you this. So, for example, so notice... The past tense form of the verb is going to be given to you. This is in the third masculine singular. So notice that it, the definition that it gives is to occupy, to preoccupy. But the form it gives is actually something more like he occupied, he, preoccup he or it preoccupied somebody, something along those lines. Remember that that's an actual form that means he blanked, right? It's the past tense form. But again, we can't predict exactly how it's going to sound just from knowing the root, because the, the vowel in the center is something that can't be predicted. In the present tense, they don't even write it out for you. They just give you the vowel that you'll hear in the present tense. Remember, that vowel is different. You'd say yeshrub to drink. He drinks, right? Yeshrub with a fatha. But you would say yektub with a kasra. In this case, we would pronounce this word yeshechel. Now, it also gives us the master. Remember, the master is not predictable. And notice that there's more than one form here, pronounced just slightly different, shahul and shahul, right? The two are used apparently fairly interchangeably. Um, it just happens that there, there's two options available. Now, remember, every verb may or may not have special prepositions. And this is true with English as well, right? We work up a sweat while working out, then we go and work on our homework, and every one of those things is totally different. So in Arabic, it's important to know these prepositions because they're not always going to be totally obvious. And so the dictionary shows you the prepositions right here. So you kind of go from the inside out in this particular instance. So you see that little ha thing refers to somebody and a ba refers to with. with. So you kind of go from the inside out to understand exactly how to use that. Ha, in some cases, like the one circled here, means that there is no preposition. So it would just be shovel a rajal or shovelni or whatever. It's just um, a way of writing, of indicating that there is no preposition because it's really important in Arabic to get your prepositions right. It's how you can figure out what goes with what in the sentence. After we get through the Form 1 information, the dictionary gives us Forms 2 and higher. Now, notice that they don't even tell us how to pronounce anything with these forms, right? They just say Roman numeral 2 and give us a bunch of definitions. They give us Roman numeral 3 and give us a bunch of definitions. That means eventually we need to memorize those forms so that we can look these things up very quickly. Also, luckily, the back of Elki tab has a grammar section that has a whole chart for you. Notice, for example, that we don't know a lot of the verbs in this root, but we do know form 8, ishtahl, or we're used to saying beshtahl, bishtahl, right? And it means to work, as we're, as we're familiar with. After the verbs, we get nouns and adjectives. Remember, in Arabic, nouns and adjectives are a little 
ambiguous and sometimes one can sort of fulfill the role of the other. If you look at that second one, it says very busy, but it can also mean like someone who is worker, a worker or a workman or someone who's sort of a laborer. Um, the, in general, the nouns are sort of presented in the order of how long the noun is, sort of a general rule of thumb. Um, you'll, you'll start to, as you understand Arabic better, start to understand the organization more clearly. But in general, it starts with the shortest noun, uh, noun that has no additional pattern or anything like that and, and moves out from there. Remember, the pronunciation is given to us not with the short vowel markings in this dictionary. It's given to us in these English letters. You should be able to figure out that that little g with a line on the top means rein because you can look at the Arabic. But the important thing is it tells us how to pronounce the noun. Shuhl, right? Notice that it's an adamma on top of the sheen. The noun entries also tell us about what's plural. So, eshgal, shuhul, again, it gives us two different plurals. It doesn't really give different definitions after them, so they're probably interchangeable. Again, sometimes you can do that in Arabic. It's helpful if you found a word, right? We saw shuhul, shuhul, shuhul right? We got rid of the wow. They're like, okay, it's shuhul. We go and we look. And we might have to look down in here in the plural section to find that particular plural. If you want to learn a new plural or use a new plural, just use the first one. After all that, you get some idioms. This is really helpful because sometimes words mean more than the sum of their parts. And this is the section that shows you how these words come, or shows you what different meanings they might have, right? So there's one, you'll see, shuhul uh, yed, handmade work of the hand, all right? Uh, again, it's, they're trying to save space, so sometimes they don't write everything out, but you should be able to figure those kinds of things out. The idioms always come after that up and down, what we call in computer science, the pipe symbol. Now, you might have noticed that there were a lot of words given for each Arabic word in the, in the previous uh, definitions. This is because there's not really a one-to-one -one correlation of English words to Arabic words. But what Hans Ver is doing for us is giving us ways that a word could be translated depending on different contexts, right? So in one context, it might mean something in English, like it might mean one thing in English, and in another context, it might mean something else. So I found some examples from a newspaper that illustrate this really nicely. So here, we, if we look at the dictionary, Hans Ver has told us that this verb can mean to busy oneself, to occupy oneself, to be occupied with, right? And that's a really good translation for this particular usage, right? It couldn't possibly be, mean what we think of as ishtaba, like to work, right? Because he can't work in this area when we're talking about how he just started his academic career, basically. On the other hand, in other contexts, it makes a lot of sense to translate it as work, which Hans Ver has given us that uh, meaning in, in its list of meanings. So after graduation, he worked teaching Arabic language and literature in Antakya, right? It makes a lot of sense because now that he knows stuff, he can do that. Now, we all love Google, right? It's so easy. You just go to Google. You go and you click and you type something in. You cut and paste it onto your paper, and then the professor scowls at you because it makes no sense, right? Here they tried to translate meatball and got Paul is dead. Really not something you want to trust. But I am a big believer in using tools properly. Google is a tool. It is something that is untrustworthy, but if we can verify it, then it's a useful tool. So, here's how you do it. Go to Google, type something in in English, and you'll get the Arabic, right? Now, Google may have given you one Arabic word. Nowadays, you can click on it, and it'll give you multiple suggestions, a little bit of extra meaning. Go and check Hans before anything else. Before you write it down on your paper, before you do anything else, go and check Hans. Is it really a word meaning this, what exactly you want it to mean? All right, maybe it is. Great. Then, 
pay attention to how you actually pronounce the word using Hans, right? So that if you try to use that word in class, it's not just a jumble of consonants and you throw in who knows what vowels, right? So write the short vowels into your composition or whatever you're using Google Translate for so that I know what word it is and so that when you come across it again, you can pronounce it again. Say it out loud. Figure out how the word is said because, again, Arabic is BYO vowels, right? If you don't find the vowels, they aren't there. Finally, check what prepositions you need. Remember, prepositions can change the meaning. We can work on something, we can work over something, we can work up something, we can work out. If I work you over, it's not necessarily a good thing. If your doctor does a workup on you, it's probably a pretty good thing. But if you don't know those prepositions, you're going to have a really hard time making any sense in Arabic. There are some other dictionaries available these days. Because we don't all have a paper copy of the dictionary, we can use this online version that includes some other dictionaries as well. It's a very nice resource. Uh, it's at etjel.net slash aa. And again, it has a lot of other dictionaries. It's nice because you can type in the root letters that you're assuming a, a word is, and it'll bring you approximately to that root. It's nice because if you don't have your big heavy dictionary with you, it can be kind of nicer. Another possibility, if you're interested in purchasing this, if you're interested in purchasing this, is the Oxford Arabic Dictionary. This is a brand new dictionary. It's both Arabic English and English Arabic. But the current printed edition of it is enormous. It's six pounds. And it's huge. So, at the moment, I recommend if you're interested in this particular dictionary, it's, it's much more modern. It has maybe three times as many entries as Hans Ver. On the other hand, I have yet to find something in this dictionary that I haven't found in Hans. Because most of the things in Hans are pretty everyday sort of words. For your purposes, Hans is probably fine. But if you want this dictionary, the online version can be purchased for $15 a year, dollars a year, and you can do a, a sort of an automatic search. This is nice, but you still are going to have to learn how to use the roots. Shukran!